Hello guys, I would like to welcome you to this week's Sunday School lesson. In this week's lesson, the pastor will share with you from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, verses 12 through 22. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, if you would like to donate to our new Bethel Baptist Church Ministries, you can donate any amount to P.O. Box 18661, Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and zip code 39404. God bless you guys, and enjoy the lesson. Hi. I'm Brother Lars Jordan, pastor of the New Bethel Baptist Church, located at 2729 Oak Grove Road in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And today our Sunday School lesson for January the 1st, 2023, the first day of the year. And our lesson is God Promises to Hear and Forgive. And our Bible scriptures today are taken from 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter, verses 12 through 22. And we're still in this quarterly theme of from darkness to light, but our unit of study changes for this month for at to God's promises. God's promises. And we do say happy new year as we start out this new year. The first day of the year just happened to be today uh, a Sunday if you're if you're listening to this on a Sunday and we are wishing that the best for you for this year or praying the best for you for this year that we are going into, that the Lord will continue to bless and uh, shower down his blessings upon all of those that trust and believe in him. And we go into this lesson today, God's promises to hear and forgive. Most of us knowing that the seventh chapter of Second Chronicles is something that has been recited for years, the 14th verse particularly, and it has been spread like peanut butter over a slice of bread, and we try to use it on every situation, but if we step back and look at what is being said there to Solomon by God, this is God speaking. He's speaking to a direct people, to a specific people especially, and also to speaking to a specific nation as a whole, not to a, a particular person at, in that verse. But he will have a message for King Solomon as he, as, as he is speaking here. And he's answering Solomon's prayer when he does speak this. Now, it isn't to us in particular, but it is for us in application as a nation, as a people, but not necessarily as personal people, because it is talking about a group of people and a nation and even a land where it definitely never gets into talking to, to us about an actual land. And we will try to put our land in there, but we are we are not Jerusalem. We are not Judah. We are not Israel, the land uh, that, that God gave them, that God promised Abraham Isaac and Jacob. We're we're not we, America is just not that place. But we will try to push it in there just what this as we foresaid that we try to use some of the scripture even though it's all for us uh to apply to our lives. It is not all written about us or to us in that particular manner. So we have to be careful when we go into the scripture to try not to use everything like we use peanut butter on a piece of light bread. And so we have to be careful when we go into the scripture. Just don't use it for everything, but understand contextually what it's talking about and who it's talking to. But it does apply to your lives in a certain way. If you will bring the things out that do apply to your lives in particular or to your nation particularly, but it doesn't apply to all the nations because it can't. Because if it did, we would all have to head back, head to Jerusalem when we get ready to pray or, or turn to Jerusalem when we get ready to pray uh, or go to that house, which is not there anymore. It's been torn down, but still, we have to be careful when we start trying to put everything into a compartment and, and use it in, in that particular way. But we can apply certain parts of it to our lives in particular manners. Now, 
God here talking to Solomon. Solomon has just prayed and God had, had, had manifest himself in a wonderful way after the temple that Solomon built was complete. We may want to call it Solomon's temple, but remember who got the, the, the elements together, to the building material together to have that temple built. Remember, it was David that wanted to build a temple for God. And God said, because of the blood on your hand, because you were a man of war, you can't build me a, a house, but I will build you a house. I'll give you an established house that will last throughout eternity. And we, we see that Jesus will sit on that throne, the throne of David forever and ever. It, this was a promise that was made to David by God. Not because David was such a wonderful and good guy, but because David had a heart for the things of God. He, was, he, 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 he loved God with all his heart, even when he did wrong. And some of us probably can say the same thing. We have looked at people in the scripture and we saw that they were, they were people that seemed like kind of shady guys. We've gone over Jacob. We've, we've gone through the life, life of Jacob and we saw how bad he was, but still he had a heart for the things of God. And God honors that when a person has a heart for him. Solomon, he would break every rule in the book. But he did have a heart for the, uh, for the things of God. So God said that I won't tear the kingdom apart until after you are gone off the scene. So his son, his, his son Rehoboam got to see all of these things happen that would be the destruction of the kingdom and, and the temple and everything and, and the tearing apart of the nation after Solomon was off the scene. But God started this off. Uh, this, this chapter started off after this man had finished praying. God did some wonderful things in manifesting himself to the people after Solomon prayed and he wanted to be able to lead the people of God and do the right thing according to God's will and according to God's way. And some of the things that are mentioned even in our lesson today were particular things that Solomon had prayed about and prayed for as, as God would get into saying that if this happened, this will happen. This will be a conditional promise that God will give to this, this man, Solomon. Now, when we are accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we got to understand things in the proper perspective. We are in a, in a, in a position now where Jesus has already came and gone to the cross, died, rose again, and is now seated at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for you and I. So the, the, the promises that he made to us, they're not based on condition of us. They're based on the, the blood of Jesus Christ. The promises that were made to Solomon and David, they were conditional promises. The promises that were made to the people of Israel, they were conditional promises, and they are still conditioned. They, the, the people of Israel hadn't come back together yet the way that they're supposed to before everything is over and the, and the Lord comes back and establishes his kingdom here on earth. All of these things hadn't happened yet to the people of Israel that were given conditional things. But when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are un unconditionally saved and, and never to be put out and, and, and to, so the devil can take us to hell again. Now, we may have consequences to, to, to spend, and these people will too, for our sins, but we can never be put out of the kingdom. We are a part of the kingdom after we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That So our, our salvation is unconditional. Well, Abraham's salvation was unconditional. God did save him and he started lying after the, after the condition was made, after he was declared righteous before God was when he lied to the pharaohs. But see, in this lesson, Today, it started out God making his presence known to these people coming in here and they got to see the glory of, of, of the Lord. The, the priests were not able to even conduct all of the things that they wanted to do in and around the temple because the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, had taken over the temple and, and, and the, the smoke filled the temple and, and God was, was just wonderfully in that place. And then God got to, to talk to this man. Let, let a verse just before our printed text started. It says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came unto Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and his own house, he prosperously effected. 
He did all of these wonderful things and, and everyone's heart was glad because God had showed him, showed up at the, the, the dedication of this temple, at the dedication of this wonderful house that David had gotten the materials together to build and Solomon had built. So now all of these things start to happen. God's promises to hear and forgive. Said Verse 12 said, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. God came to Solomon by night. Now, I don't know if it was that exact night, but he did come to him by night and he came to speak. This was after God had manifested himself to them in the Shekinah glory, showing up at the temple, at this house, showing that God was pleased. God had even picked the place for it to be be built. So God is happy with everything that is happening here. The Lord appeared to Solomon. God came to this man. He came to him in the quietness of night when no other activity was going on, when it was only God and Solomon that here to, to, to see this happen and to hear the things that were being said. And when God came to him, he said to him, he said, I've heard your prayer. In other words, I've listened to and received your prayer. That's what he's telling him here when he says, I've heard your prayer. I've listened to it. I've received your prayer. And look what, what has happened with that. He said, I have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. When did God choose this place for himself to be a house of sacrifice? We would think it just happened right now, just because we see it happening here as we read these scriptures right here. But God had pre-chosen this place. This was the place where Abraham had taken his, his son Isaac up to to sacrifice him before, uh, before God, before he found the ram caught in the thicket. And God said, the angel said, do your son no harm. There's, an, there's a ram stuck in the thick there. And, and he took the ram and he sacrificed the ram. This was there on Mount Moriah. This was the same place. He said, I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. This was the, the same place that Abraham did that. But this is the same place where on Ornan's floor was, threshing floor was. And David saw it and he wanted that threshing floor. And Ornan said, you're the king. I'll let you have it. And David said, I won't have anything that I didn't pay for. And he paid Ornan for it and, and he gave it to him. And David set this up to be a wonderful place. And, and, and Jerusalem was was there and, and around this. And, and now we see Solomon. He builds the temple there. And this is the same place that is a sacrifice, the house of sacrifice unto God. God had already chosen this way back during the days of Abraham. And now it comes into this day today where, where they are at this particular time. And God makes, and, and God continues to talk to this man, Solomon. He said, if I shut up heaven, now, remember, this man has talked about these very things himself in the 20-something 20, 20 verse of the pre previous chapter, in the sixth chapter. He said, if I shut up the heavens and there be no rain, God said, if I cause a drought to come upon this, this land, this land, this place right here, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, he said, if I shut up the heavens, if, if, if I stop the rain from falling is what God is saying here. If I let, let no rain fall upon the earth, we know what that is. That's a drought. This, that's an area where the land just, we saw some things like this even in the past seasons where even the great and mighty Mississippi started to dry up and the, and the, and the boats not being able to get up and down the river or, or the barges to take the, the, the material where they needed to get to. With God said that he can cause these things to happen. There, there be a drought in the land. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land, the, the grasshoppers, we know them to be, if, if they come in and all the greenery, if they come in and these billions of, of grasshoppers come in and eat all the greenery, when you plant your peas and, and they come in there and see them green and they come in and just attack them all and eat them up, the, the greens and the beans and, and all of those things uh, uh, before they come up and, and that devour, they devour the land. Or God said, even if I send diseases, an epidemic in to come in, uh, these diseases, a pestilence among my people. He said, 
If I send all of these things, the drought, the locusts or the, the grasshoppers to devour the, the greenery of the land, or if I send an epidemic in, he said, here is something I want the people of Israel to know. He said, if my people, particularly Israel, talking to them at this time, this is the conditions and the restoration he's going to talk about here in these next few verses. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, my people, the people of God called by his name. Who were the people of God at that time? The people of God were, were Israel when, when, when this was being talked about between God and Solomon. If my people, Israel, which are called by my name, shall first of all humble themselves, then pray, then seek my face, then turn from their wicked ways, God said this, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Now, careful again, as we go back and re restate this again. Uh, and, and Dr. McGee said this also. He said, all scripture is for us, but all scripture is not written to us. It's not written to everybody because everybody is not Israel. Now, I understand that when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we became children of faith, so we were engrafted in as seeds of Abraham in that particular life, but not Israelites ourselves. So he said, God is talking to a particular people here. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall first get rid of or swallow their pride as a nation, not as one person in the nation, but as a nation, if they will swallow their pride as a nation. So there are some prideful nations even now, even here, living here on this land. But Israel had gotten to be prideful people at one time, and they were so prideful that they fell in a place where they were uh, drought came to the land where pestilence or epidemic came to the land. We know them uh, as Babylon. They came in just like locusts and came in and caused something themselves to take away and devour the land. They, we call them, the, like we said, the, ba the Babylonians. But he says here, if you would humble yourselves, if you would get rid of or swallow your pride and then make this earnest petition or if you would pray, pray to me, pray to God, and then God said, and seek my face. He said, search, search out or get in a place of real worship, worshiping God. That's how we seek his face. We, we bow down before him. We worship him. We call on the name of the Lord. He inhabits the praises of his people. The praises of his people is not always hands waving in the air. The praises of his people when we sit down as a hymnologist saying, have a little talk with Jesus. That's what he's talking about sometimes. We will seek his face and find out what God wants me to do in this situation. It's all in the word of God. You don't need a prophet telling you with some glassy eyes what to do. It's all written, written right there in the word of God and he will encourage your heart if you'll just have that little talk with him every now and then. It said, and turn from their wicked ways. Now, again, we're talking about a nation as a whole. What was the nation doing that was wickedly? Everyone had started to put down on the poor. They had started to take away from those that were less fortunate. The judgment was going for those that, that were wealthy, that, that this is how they end up in captivity. This is how they end up snatched out of the land. Turn from their wicked ways. Turn from those things that had taken them away. If they, what what happened to the prodigal son when he was getting ready to eat the 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 food that the swines had? He realized that he didn't have to. He could go back to his father, and he went back to his father and he told him what kind of life that he had went, done, and he had he had sinned against him and and. There in the 21st verse of the 15th chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. So if we just turn back to him, turn from their wicked ways, the people of Israel had gotten quite wicked. They didn't let the land have its rest as they were supposed to. So a lot of different things had, had gone awry in the nation itself, not just one particular person themselves. Now, there can be some application for a particular person as we look at these scriptures, but this talking about nations as, as a whole, our particular nation here as a whole. And if our land wants to be healed, we can apply this in certain ways to our land, but we can't have the last thing of this 14th verse. But we still look at this and he, he says, then will I hear from heaven. After you have gone through this, 
after you have swallowed your pride, after you have prayed earnestly, after you have searched out and worshiped God with a whole heart and a whole, whole mind or sought his face, then you turn your backs, turn, turn back to him rather, you turn back to the Lord and came back to him. Yeah, and I know some say repent. Repent means to change your mind. You change your mind and you turn back to God. But sometimes if we just change our mind as an individual, sometimes that mind might change back. And people will tell you that you never had a heart for God in the first place, but people do have struggles in their life. So we can't put it in a position where they can't, if their mind is focused on Jesus, sometimes they will fall off the, the, the road every now and then. But God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. But this is talking about a nation. He said, I will hear from heaven. I will hear from heaven. And when I hear from heaven, God said, I will forgive their sin as a nation. I'll forgive the sins of the nation. You putting up these, these people that are, are, are judging the, the lower class people in a bad way. You not giving the land its rest. You're not doing the things that I put in my statues and my decrees. You, you're not doing these things. He said, I'll forgive those things if you'll just turn back to me. He said, then I will heal their land. He didn't tell us that those type of things, but this was a particular thing for the, for the land of Israel, for the land, land of Israel there as he said these things to Solomon. He said then, verse 15, he says, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend to the prayer that is made in this place. This is that anthropomorphic scene right here. God is acting as if he's not just a spiritual being, as if he's a person that has ears. Now, now, as rather than then, now God has ears and eyes as Jesus would have physical ears and eyes as he came to be born of a woman and walk among us. And, and, and he ends up with these things that a human has, and he's going to walk around heaven with, with, with reminders for us for the rest of eternity of those scars in his hands, how he had redeemed us from, from sin and brought us back to himself. So now God, Jesus will, will have scars and he will have eyes and ears. But at this time, Jesus said to the woman at the, well, at the well that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Here it is that, that, that he, he has eyes here. He's speaking of eyes, something that he didn't necessarily have as we know, but he knows all. So he can see all. He is all knowing and all seeing. So he said, I will listen to every prayer that is made in this place. He said, I'll listen to it, I'll hear it, and I'll be attended to it. I will listen to it, take it into the consideration as it comes to my ears and to my eyes. I'll see the things that are happening here in this particular place. And he says in verse, verse 16, he says, for now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there how long forever and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually or continually or from now on. However you want to say perpetually is forever. It's continuously. It doesn't stop. So from now on, he says, for, for, for now, I have elected or selected this place right here and sanctified, set apart this particular temple. In other words, when I came in and consecrated this place, I sanctified this place. I set it apart for, for, to, for my service. For the people that even come here, it'll be serving me when they come into this place and pray and worship and sanctify and, and sacrifice in this place. It'll be worshiping me. That my name will be here forever. My name will be here forever. Now we know that the actual temple was torn down. But God's name is still in the place forever, even though people can't say that God was there, even though the Ark of the Covenant was there at one time. But still, it wasn't God, but it represented God's presence. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, he felt like he was bringing God home. But he did know that you can't contain God. And Solomon would actually say that. But God did box God himself into holiness. He'll always be holiness. He'll, he'll never step out of being holy. He'll always be right there, even if we want him to step out every now and then so we can, he can, we can satisfy something of ourselves. God will always be 
holy. He said, in mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually or forever. This special place, this is a special place that I have brought, uh, made for myself. It didn't just start with you, Solomon. It started at Abraham and now it's still a special place to me. And it'll be that special place perpetually or forever. He said, and as for thee, as for you. Now, let me say something to you, Solomon, is what God is saying here. If thou will walk before me, or follow me, as David thy father walked, and do according to all that I have commanded thee. First, uh, uh, first walk as David walked, and then do according to all that I have commanded you, and then observe my statues and my judgments. He tells him here. He says, he, he says, first of all, I want you to walk the way that David did. Yes, David had some hiccups, but David always had a heart for the things of God. They, God, God is telling Solomon, be, at, be like your, your father David was in that particular sense. He said, and, uh, obey my commandments, he's telling him. And then he says, observe to keep my statues and my judgments or my uh, decrees and regulations, a dec decree, an ordained law, and, and, and a regulation is a rule prescribed by authority. God was the authority. So the, the judgment, so my, my statutes and my regulations are my judgments, these rules that were, were prescribed by uh, authority, and that that's, these words are going to come up again. So verse 18 says, he said, then will I establish the throne of thy kingdom. According as I have covenanted it with David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. This was a promise that God made. That's an, this, he said, this, I will establish the throne of thy kingdom. Your throne is going to be there because I promised this to your father. According as I have covenanted it with David thy father. In other words, I made agreement with David. This was already agreed upon. This part is unconditional. This part that I agree with David is it's not conditioned. It, it is agreement because even when we break a covenant, God is true to the covenant. We found that out with God and Abraham as God went all the way through and, and when he made the covenant with Abraham. So now he says, there should not fail thee a man to be ruler in Israel. In other words, one of your descendants, one of David's descendants will always rule over the Israelite nation and then also over the world at one time because we know it'll be Jesus Christ himself. He said, but if ye turn away. Now, when he gets to this verse, verse 19, he's not just talking to Solomon. He's talking to the entire nation of Israel here. He said, but if ye turn away, talking to the nation again, if the nation turns away or abandons me is what God is saying here and forsake my statues and my commandments, my foreordained laws or my rules and regulations that I gave you under my authority, which I have set before you, which I have given you and shall go and serve other gods and worship them or if you go and you fall into idolatry is what God is saying here to Solomon as he's talking about the nation itself. He said, then will I pluck them up by the root out of my land, which I have given them. And then there's a semicolon. Let's, he said, I'll uproot this people. I'll take them up. We know this actually happened to the, the Southern Territory as well as the Northern Territory. He took them out of the land because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry. Mainly the, the main thing was idolatry that took them up. How they treated people, not giving the land rest, but idolatry was the big thing because they began to worship other gods and Solomon would fall into that greatly himself. He said, "I will uh, uh, the land that I've given them, he said, in this house which I have sanctified for my name, will I cast out of my sight. He said, this house that I've set apart, that I've made holy, that I brought in and set it apart for myself, he said, I'll reject it, is what God is saying here. I'll cast it out of my sight. He said, and I, and I will make this house, this very place, because it'll be just rubble standing there, I will make it a, a, a proverb, 
are mockery. It'll be mockery. People will come by looking at it and scratching their head and that and, and a byword. They'll come by and they'll really ridicule. But it'll be among all the nations. And all the nations will come by saying, Wow, what in the world has happened here? This was a people that God had given this land and no one could come against them during the days of David and Solomon and, and look at the place now. And this house, which is high, God is saying here, shall be an astonishment to everyone that passes by it so that he shall say, why has the Lord done thus unto, the land, unto this land and unto this house? He said, in this house, this, this wonderfully built temple, this wonderful place, this spectacular place right here. He said, it shall be a place where people will be scratching their head and say, wow, what in the world happened there and, and when they pass by it? And so shall he say, why has the Lord done this? In other words, why have the Lord allowed this to happen? Because we know that no mere man could have done this on his own. The, the Lord said, the Bible says, Habakkuk was told that the, the Lord said, write the vision and make it plain. When Habakkuk said, look, you're not going to do anything about the way that people are living there, the, the Israelite people are living, and God says, if I told you, you wouldn't believe the things that, that's going to happen. He hit, said, I have raised me up a nation, the Chaldeans, or we know them as the Babylonians. They're going to go in, and they're going to take this place apart, flying as fast as eagles. And he said, no mere man would be able to do that. And these people would know that no mere man could have done these things that are going to happen to this nation right here. Why has the Lord done this to this land? God has allowed it to happen. He didn't do it necessarily himself, but he allowed it to happen. He allowed the Chaldeans to be raised up or the Babylonians to come in and take that land. And verse 22 says, and it shall be answered. This will be the answer for that. God even gave him the answer. He said, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, they abandoned God. They turned their back on God. They went to worshiping other gods. It, he, he's going to say that specifically here. He said they abandoned the, the God of their fathers, which brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. Always go back to the, the time that God first started blessing the people of Israel. He brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them. They laid hold on other gods. In other words, they took for themselves these idol gods. Then they bowed themselves down to these idol gods. Then they began to serve the idol gods, even though the idol gods had no words to say. They would just go the direction that people wanted them to go. And then there's a colon at the end of serve them. It says, therefore has he brought all this evil upon them. In other words, he allowed these things to happen to his people to bring them back eventually to him one day. God promises to hear and he promises to forgive. Father God, we thank you today for the study of your word. And Father, we pray that this word will simmer on our hearts and minds and help us even as a nation now to begin to pray and seek your face, Lord, so that you can come in and give us healing. Lord, we may not be the people that were promised this, but we do need healing and we understand that. So Father, we pray that you will search our hearts. Forgive us of sin. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining the Sunday School Lesson Review. Hope to see you next week. God bless you all.